All right, here we go. We have Peter Schiff, financial investor and entrepreneur who predicted the 2008 financial crash. Welcome to Vlad TV. Oh, thanks, Vlad, for making me a part of Vlad TV. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is our first time actually sitting down, so I want to get into your into your whole story. So you were born in Connecticut. Yes, I was. Way back in 1963. Correct. Correct. And uh, I guess your father uh, was the son of Jewish immigrants from Poland? Uh, he was, yeah. In fact, they immigrated to the United States around the turn of the 19th century, and they found their way to Connecticut because my grandfather was a carpenter and he got a job helping to construct the Yale Bowl. And so he moved out there and then he stayed there and lived his entire life there. He raised eight children, including my dad. I always talk about the fact that my grandfather came here, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, no money, didn't speak any English. But when he got here, you know, there were no welfare workers, there was no government assistance, there was no minimum wage, food stamps. Uh, None of this stuff, uh, but he was able to get a job, uh, eventually get married, raise a family uh, without any help from the government. My grandmother never had to work outside the home. Uh, they didn't have to borrow any money on credit cards or take out any loans, yet they owned a home. They owned a car. Eventually, he even had a beach house in Connecticut. He never did anything more than just work as a carpenter, although he was self-employed for a while had a couple of assistants, but, you know, everything was in cash. And he lived his entire life, uh, you know, without really, you know, having any, any of the assistance that we claim is necessary now. But it's interesting that you can't do that anymore in America. I mean, my grandfather, not only didn't he go to co college, he didn't even go to high school, yet he was able to support my grandmother and eight children uh, without any help and without taking on any debt. Yet he still owned a house, a car, and all that. Um, and, and so, you know, why can't we do that today? And the reason is because we have a lot of government today that we didn't have back then. Well, your parents actually divorced while you were still young. Yeah, my parents separated. Uh, I have a brother who's a couple years younger. So I was about five when, when, when they separated. Okay, so your mom gets divorced. She has two kids. You know, in terms of your upbringing from that point on, do you think that your family was struggling or they were middle class and doing okay? No, I mean, we weren't struggling. I mean, my mom worked. You know, my dad really, you know, didn't pay enough in child support so that my mom, you know, could just stay home. Uh, so she had to work. But my dad did, you know, contribute to, you know, the costs. But, you know, my mom managed to ultimately make a good living, and we ended up living in some pretty nice places uh, throughout the course of my life, although we didn't move around quite a bit because my mom moved around. So, you know, we moved down uh, to the city initially. We moved out of Connecticut. We moved to Manhattan. And then uh, my mom moved this all down to Florida, where her parents were, so they could kind of watch us while she went off to work. And eventually she moved back up to the city and then out to Southern California. And that's uh, where I ended up graduating from high school. Okay. Now, your dad was, I guess, what you would call a tax protester? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people call, call him a tax protester. In fact, there was a whole tax protest movement. And I guess for a while, my dad, maybe he was the leader of it or the most well-known of the so-called tax protesters. I mean, the government liked to label people like my dad tax protesters, or even they would say illegal tax protesters. But what my dad was protesting was the illegal manner in which the government went about collecting and enforcing the income tax. So my father didn't protest legitimate taxation. Uh, he may object to high taxation, but he wasn't protesting uh, taxes that he believed were being legally imposed or legally collected. But he was very convinced, based on his own studying of the Constitution, of various Supreme Court cases and the Internal Revenue Code itself that the government was collecting, enforcing the income tax illegally. And so that's what he was protesting, government illegal activity. Well, and you've seen a lot of people over the years try to do that. Uh, they try to say that technically, you know, you're not required to pay taxes or, you know, I remember there was a movement 
that if you came from Africa, you technically didn't owe taxes or if you were a descendant of, of, of slaves or so forth. Yeah. But ultimately, these things never really work out. Yeah, well, they worked out for a lot of people. My, my dad didn't pay taxes for a long time, uh, maybe 10, 20 years before he actually had any problems with the IRS. And that was only because he started going on television shows talking about the fact that he wasn't paying. But when he was just not paying, uh, they basically left him alone, even though he wasn't hiding. My father told the government that he wasn't paying and why he wasn't going to pay. And they they pretty much left him alone until there was a lot of pressure because he was being very public about what he was doing, because his goal was to try to force the government to obey the law. It wasn't that he was just trying to get away with not paying taxes. He didn't want the government to get away with breaking the law or violating the Constitution. And in fact, you know, it's hard to really get into uh, all the aspects uh, of my dad's view on the income tax. But, you know, one of the books that he wrote called The Federal Mafia, uh, one of the interesting things about this book, as far as maybe a potential trivial pursuit question, is there's only been two books in all of American history to have been banned by the U.S. government. One was Fanny Hill, and that was banned because they considered it to be pornographic. I mean, it would be, you know, nobody would consider it pornographic by today's standards. But back then, uh, it was pornographic, and so the U.S. government banned it. The other book was my father's book, The Federal Mafia. The U.S. government actually banned him from selling that book. But it's not illegal to buy it, and it's not illegal for me to sell it. It was only illegal for my father to sell it. So we still have some copies if people want to go to shiftbooks.com. I don't have that many left, but I've got a few of these books. And if you read that, you'll understand my father's case against the income tax and, and why, you know, why it's based on voluntary compliance. It's, it's not an accident that the government describes compliance as being voluntary. It's voluntary because it's optional. And the reason it's optional is because if it was compulsory, it would violate all sorts of uh, laws, the Constitution, uh, the Internal Revenue Code. So the government makes it optional, makes it voluntary, because if something is voluntary, well, then it can't be illegal. But then the government tries to enforce it as if it was mandatory. But you got to really read through his book and you can look at all of his arguments and decide for yourself. But regardless of whether or not you are convinced my father is right, my advice is ignore uh, anything he says about don't paying taxes because I've always paid uh, the income tax my entire life because I recognize that the court system is corrupt. And so even if I believe my father, I don't think that the courts are going to be honest. I don't think that they're going to apply the law uh, against the government the way they should. So, I, you know, even though I think that I'm not legally required to pay taxes, I've always paid them. Now, I don't pay a lot of taxes anymore because I've moved to Puerto Rico. That's something else that we can discuss. So by living in Puerto Rico, my tax obligation has been considerably reduced. So, you know, I'm not paying a lot of taxes. And, and that's kind of one of the ways you know, I'm able to, uh, you know, accomplish that, not by having a legal battle like my dad did and end up in jail. I'm playing by the rules that the IRS, you know, will respect. And one of those rules is if you live in Puerto Rico, uh, there are some considerable tax advantages that you're able to take advantage of. Well, I mean, like you, you just mentioned, your dad ended up getting 13 years in federal prison? Yeah, his final, he was in jail three times, but the last time he was in jail, he got, I think, like a 12 or 13 year sentence. And when you're already 70 years old or whatever he was when he got the sentence or 75, 76, 77, he died in jail at the age of 87. Right. So I think he was 10 years into his sentence. But even after he was diagnosed with terminal cancer, we still couldn't get him out of jail. In fact, he died handcuffed to a hospital bed. Um, you know, that's, they wouldn't let him out. And really what my dad died of was skin cancer. He got skin cancer that the government doctors didn't even bother to treat. And so it ended up spreading out through his entire body. He'd probably still be alive today. He may have, he, he would have gotten out of jail by now had the government not allowed him to die. But that's another example of why you don't want the government involved in healthcare. Because when the government provides health care, it's horrible. Because my father was basically incarcerated in a government hospital, yet he died of skin cancer, right? A, a private doctor would have cured it 
very easily. My father was very healthy otherwise, but left to government care, uh, you know, he basically died from a, the equivalent of malpractice. I mean, yeah, I've had skin cancer. I had it on my face once. It was yeah. uh, a little 30 minute operation. They cut it out and then you're done. You yeah. But what would happen and- if you just left it there and did nothing? <laughs> yeah. It would have killed me. Yeah. So, right. yeah, that's, so that's what the government did to my dad. So he ended up getting the death penalty for, you know, exercising his constitutional rights. 